So in some ways, they were just progressing to the next step, ultimately, that monarchy was not necessary. They were living in a monarchy by that time. I think it's actually correct, even though the parliament was very problematic to the 13 colonies. It can be described as a monarchical republic. I think that's very, very some very thoughtful writers at the time, Cato, who wrote Cato's letters, have said that. So I just thought they, they, they really wanted to get rid of arbitrary government and government where uh, one man or woman, and then one man had extreme, had, had extreme power over the entire government. So that they felt it was the, the best form of government you could possibly uh, evolve, so they went for in that direction. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. My name is Nat Scheidley, and I'm the CEO of Revolutionary Spaces, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Old South Meeting House tonight for our program, introducing historian Eli Merritt's new book, Disunion Among Ourselves, The Perilous Politics of the American Revolution. Welcome also to those who are watching us online through our partnership with the Forum Network, a joint venture of GBH and the Lowell Institute. Here at Revolutionary Spaces, our mission is to bring people together to explore our nation's unfinished struggle to create and sustain a free society as evoked by the two national treasures we care for here at Old South Meeting House and the Old State House, which is located just a couple of blocks down Washington Street. <clears throat> this year, we are commemorating the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, which began right here in Old South Meeting House. And we're using this important moment as an invitation to reconsider our founding story and its legacies. And tonight's program is a very important and useful part of that programming arc. Uh, if you enjoy tonight's program, and you would like to support our work here at Revolutionary Spaces, I hope you'll consider becoming a member by giving a gift in any amount that is meaningful to you. We have some membership information available at the registration desk where you came in, or it's also available online at revolutionaryspaces.org. And of course, I also want to thank all of our current members and donors, including the Lowell Institute, whose generous support makes free public programs such as this possible. As we begin, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge on behalf of Revolutionary Spaces that the sites we care for, Old South Meeting House and the Old State House, both stand on the occupied, still unceded homeland of the Massachusetts tribe. We honor and respect the many native peoples who are connected to this place, past, present, and future, including the Nipmuc, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag peoples. Revolutionary Spaces supports our native neighbors and is committed to understanding and dismantling the destructive legacies of settler colonialism that are quite literally embodied in the histories of our buildings. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome Professor Eli Merritt of Vanderbilt University to talk with us about his new book, Disunion Among Ourselves. Professor Merritt's bona fides are as wide-ranging as his interests. He holds an undergraduate degree from Yale University and advanced degrees from Yale and Case Western Reserve University. Prior to becoming a political historian, he had a distinguished career in psychiatry that took him to Stanford University, among other places. I'm a Stanford grad, so I had to mention that. Um, today, he specializes in the history of the founding era and the complex intersection between demagogues and democracy. So in other words, he's clearly a scholar for our times. Professor Merritt's book explores the fractious politics of the revolutionary era, reminding us that there's really nothing foreordained or given about our national union. And if that reminder feels a little bit unsettling at this moment, um, given the polarization in our politics today, I hope that maybe there is something reassuring in the knowledge that the founding generation overcame far sharper differences of policy and interest than those we face today. 
So it's now my pleasure to invite Professor Merritt to come up here uh, and to turn the floor over to him uh, to share this important story and suggest how it might serve as a touchstone for our contemporary politics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nat. It's, um, it's great to be in this historic space uh, where heroes of mine like uh, Sam Adams, father of the American Revolution, made so much good trouble. So I'm honored to be here with you. Um, I would like to start today by telling you about my approach to historical research. It has a lot to do with my childhood and ultimately my discovery through adversity that fear is the number one driver of human behavior. History, as Nat mentioned, is my second career. Before that, I practiced psychiatry for 20 years. As part of my work, I prescribed medications, but my area of greatest expertise was existential psychotherapy, which is a treatment that focuses on life's most precious commodities, which are finding meaning, finding emotional connection with others, and coping with fear of death. One reason I went into psychiatry was to explore my own emotions, especially fear as it relates to the death of my mother by suicide when I was six years old. Believe it or not, I, it had no real impact on me until I turned 17 years old and left to go to college. That was when I first encountered the potent forces of depression, grief, and fear that are associated with the loss of this kind. Let's see if we can As I struggled to get healthy during those years, what I found the most intractable, but also the most fascinating, was my own fear. What I feared is that I would end up like my mother. I feared genetic predetermination or psychological predetermination would doom me to her fate. My way out of the maze was to make fear a dedicated object of study. I worked hard for years to become a mindfulness master of my own inner fear. To my good fortune, during my 20s, slowly but surely, I was able to get free of this existential dread. Ever since that time, though, I have continued to believe that fear is the number one driver of human behavior and also the number one driver of human history. This fear approach to human behavior is also how I went about researching and writing my book, Disunion Among Ourselves. It's about what the founders feared most in their political decision-making during the years of the American Revolution. I believe that if we can get to the core content that lit, that lit up the fear centers in the brains of great leaders like Washington and Madison and, and Hamilton and Sam Adams, we will understand the founding of the United States in new and insightful ways. By understanding what they feared, we will move closer to seeing the complex truth of what actually happened during those critical decades of the 1770s and the 1780s. What I discovered in my research is that more than anything else, the founders feared that disunion among themselves would lead to civil wars. If they split apart into separate confederations, they would kill one another on the battlefield. Historians have long taught that the greatest threat to the new American states after the Declaration of Independence was the British Army and Navy, but that is not true. The founders themselves believed that the greatest danger to the American experiment during these years was disunion and civil wars. They considered that a three-step chain reaction would be their undoing. First in the chain reaction, one or more states would secede from the Union. Then, all of the states would separate into separate confederations, either two of them a northern and southern confederation, or more frequently discussed, a New England confederation, a middle confederation, and a confederation of the southern colonies. <clears throat> Disunion, however, was not actually the problem. It may sound strange to us today, but if the founders could have separated and lived peacefully in two to three confederations, that is almost certainly the path they would have chosen. It was the third step in the chain reaction after the formation of separate confederations that was the source of their greatest fears. If disunion happened, 
there would be civil wars over finances, commerce, and most of all, land. The reason the founders united into one government is that they believed there was no other bloodless alternative. With no central mediating government to arbitrate their conflicts, they would be left with only the sword and the musket to decide the fate of America. In the introduction of the book, I call this explanatory model the survivalist interpretation. That is, the founders did what they did. They adopted the Declaration of Independence, ratified the Articles of Confederation, and compromised on some things, but not on other things, for the singular purpose of shielding themselves from civil war. It all boiled down to self-preservation. My favorite way to look at their dilemma is as a shotgun wedding. The founders united not voluntarily, but because they had the guns of civil war constantly pointing at their backs. They did what they did to save their souls from civil wars. That is the one big idea I hope readers will take away from the book, and the same one I hope you'll take away from this presentation. This union, they knew, was a sure path to national suicide. Now I want to ask you to think about a puzzle, the greatest and certainly the most tragic puzzle of all American history. And that is why did the founders perpetuate slavery in spite of the unthinkable hypocrisy and horror of it? Why did these enlightenment thinkers do this awful thing? These brilliant men who celebrated liberty and equality more than any other values on earth. The founders committed one of the greatest crimes against humanity ever committed. Why? Why they perpetuated slavery is the most profound question we will discuss today. But first, let's look at what the survivalist interpretation means for us today as we look back on the 1770s and the 1780s. Does this interpretation cast the founders in a new negative light or in a new positive light? To me, first and foremost, the survivalist interpretation reveals new truth about the founding period, and that is what matters most in a democracy seeking truth for truth's sake. Recently, I was contacted by the director of a historical organization in Massachusetts, right here. He had just started reading the book. We had been on the phone for less than a minute when he said, quote, your book scares the hell out of me. I'm like, thanks a lot. <laughs> he went on to explain the reason, saying that he now fears that disunion and civil wars might be written into American DNA. In a way, he's right that the book contains ominous content. In light of the way we view the founders, an idolized manner, the survivalist interpretation is a difficult pill to swallow. But this history also fills me with awe and wonder and amazement. They did it. The founders held the United States together and won the war, not only in spite of the technical advantages of the British Army and Navy, but also in spite of the overwhelming centrifugal forces of disunion that were acting on them every day. They won the war, they formed a nation, they united under our first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, and in the Treaty of Paris that ended the war in 1783, they negotiated successfully to attain the entire Trans-Appalachian West, spreading to the Mississippi River, which doubled the acreage of the United States. Historian Edmund Morgan has called the peace treaty that ended the War of Independence the greatest diplomatic victory the United States has ever achieved. In most regards, this new history doubly transforms the founders into heroes. They're heroic once for winning the war and twice for remaining united despite the tremendous odds. However, they were only heroic when it comes to the preservation of their own race and their own liberties and freedoms. There was an unfathomable cost to the Union that the founders forged against the odds. It was the perpetuation of slavery, which we will discuss is the last and most important item we covered today. Let's next look at the specific fears of civil wars of four delegates who attended the Continental Congress. What kinds of civil wars did they foresee? Who would fight whom, why, and when? This dapper gentleman here is John Witherspoon, 
At the time he served in Congress, he was considered to be one of the most brilliant men in America. He was president of the college, later named Princeton, and he was the colony's foremost scholar of the Scottish Enlightenment. Let me read to you from a speech Witherspoon delivered in Congress in response to assertions by many delegates that the 13 states should only loosely associate themselves as allies during the war, not as permanent members of a durable and lasting constitutional union. He warned with all the vehemence he could muster that the 13 states must unite into one perpetual government because if they did not, the war of independence was going to be, quote, only a prelude to a contest of a more dreadful nature, and indeed much more properly called a civil war than the one in which we are engaged today. Why, Witherspoon asked, should the citizens of the American states expend their mutual treasure and blood in the 1770s seeking to obtain independence from the British, quote, with a certainty as soon as peace was settled with them of a more lasting war, a more unnatural, more bloody, and much more hopeless war among the colonies themselves. Civil war among the states, that is what Witherspoon feared. And he was certain it was going to happen if the original 13 colonies did not permanently unite into one government where they could peacefully settle their differences. Witherspoon said all this, but he did not mention what would cause the great civil war he was describing or who the belligerents would be. Another prominent American delegate, Joseph Galloway of Pennsylvania, gave a much more concrete answer to the question, what would the civil war of the future look like? Galloway was also an erudite, highly intelligent political leader. He was a veteran of colonial and ministerial politics from well before the Stamp Act. He served as Speaker of the House of the Pennsylvania Assembly for eight years, and he was a close friend and frequent correspondent of Benjamin Franklin. In a widely distributed pamphlet published in the first year of the war, Galloway warned Americans that they should never even launch into independence, because if they did, the loss of the supreme arbitration powers of Britain would bring forth two subcategories of civil wars, both geographic types of civil wars. One would be land wars between colonies, and at some point in the future, there would be, he predicted, a bloody conflagration between North and South. Like so many other observers of the American scene in these years, Galloway considered the British Empire to be a vital protector of the vulnerable agricultural southern colonies. Shorn of the mediating control of the king and parliament, he said there would come a time after independence when the, when the maritime northern colonies would invade the southern ones. Here's what Galloway wrote. Once the states became independent, quote, the northern colonies, inured to military discipline and hardship, will in all probability be the first to enter the list of military controversy. And, like the northern Saxons and Danes, they will carry devastation and havoc over the southern, who, weak for want of discipline, and having a dangerous enemy within their bowels, must, after suffering all the horrors of a civil war, yield to the superior force and submit to the will of the conquerors. Is this what Galloway envisioned, a civil war between the North and South, where the South would lose due to a dangerous enemy within its bowels? That is, enslaved black, black Americans who would rise up and join the Northern effort in order to gain their own liberty and freedom? Galloway didn't fully specify, but I believe the emancipation of enslaved people is something that Galloway and others imagined might happen when and if a major civil war broke out. This is John Dickinson. This will bring us close to the heart of New England. Dickinson also feared independence would lead to disunion and civil wars, but he foresaw a different dividing line. Dickinson disagreed with independence so much that he refused to sign the Declaration of Independence. But he remained a patriot and did end up signing the Constitution in 1787. Here we have New England, where we are now. What Dickinson envisioned is that after a successful war of independence, New England would secede from the Union, 
and then make war on New York State in order to gain control of the Hudson River. Looking into what he called the Doomsday Book of America, Dickinson conjectured that New England would break off from the American Union within 20 or 30 years after independence. It would then invade New York, and that would be the start of a massive civil war, he said, that was too dreadful to contemplate. Why was there so much fear of New England? One reason is that New Englanders were famously, at that time, hardy and united. Another is that they were a seafaring people. They were sailors, captains, shipbuilders, rope makers, and cod fishermen. That meant that they, with much greater skill and efficiency than any of the other states, could build up a formidable navy, which was, of course, the linchpin of imperial power in the 18th century. That's one reason everyone was very afraid of New England. The Hudson River is a glorious commercial artery that is located solely within the state of New York. It's approximately 50 miles from the border of New England, and it was very frequently discussed as a flashpoint where civil war would start. Another American who observed the danger surrounding the Hudson River was Charles Thompson, a Pennsylvanian who served as the Secretary of the Continental Congress throughout the entire war. As the official scribe for everything that was said and done in Congress, no one understood the political dynamics of America better than Thompson. In a series of letters to his wife, whose name was Hannah, Thompson acknowledged towards the end of the war that he thought it highly improbable that the American Union would long survive. When I look forward, he wrote to Hannah, I see a dark cloud and gloomy prospects for America. Instead of one union, Thompson predicted that there would be calamities leading to the formation of three or four separate American confederations. One of the confederations that would form, he forecast, was composed of the New England states, but there was always the problem of the Hudson River. Like Dickinson, Thompson felt confident that New England would not rest until they gained control of that vital waterway. That meant that New York was either going to have to join the New England Confederation willingly, or there would be war. For the purpose of securing the Hudson, Thompson said, quote, New York will be compelled to join this Confederacy, either voluntarily or by force. Thompson also predicted civil wars in the Trans-Appalachian West because a middle confederation of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland, most likely, was going to form both for self-defense and to expand westward over the mountains into the lands above the Ohio River stretching towards the Great Lakes. But there was a problem here as well. In the Trans-Appalachian West, the middle confederation was going to encounter fierce resistance to its westward expansion by the next nation that Thompson said would rise up in America. It was the Confederation of Virginia all by itself. The massive and most wealthy colony in America claimed almost all the territory across the mountains, beginning with its Kentucky territory, northward all the way to Canada. And when these claims were encroached by a middle confederation, there would be war. Thompson also envisioned that, envisioned that the nation state of Virginia might be a monarchy. Quote, the haughtiness of Virginia, its great extent, and its boundless claims will induce it to set up for itself. And if ever royal government is set up in North America, here it will first erect its throne. The Secretary of Congress felt confident about the formation of these three confederations. New England joined to New York, Middle Confederation, and Virginia by itself. Uh, but he admitted openly he had no idea what was going to become of the three other southern states, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. The wild card in all of this, he believed, was South Carolina. Thompson observed, kind of amazing to think back all the way to then, Thompson observed that South Carolina was unique in the 13 colonies for its hot-headedness and irascibility. So much so, that the state would have to be humbled by civil wars before its people would agree to join any confederation. Here's what he wrote, quote, for such is the fiery pride of South Carolina, such the dissipation of her morals and her insolence 
occasioned by a multitude of slaves, that she will not cordially voin, join in any union till she is taught wisdom by sore suffering. We've discussed at least some of the scenarios of civil war that haunted American political leaders as they contemplated the breakup of the 13 colonies and later states. Now let's look at the impact of these fears on three critical politi political decisions they made. First, why the Congress elected George Washington as commander in chief. Second, how and why the, the Declaration of Independence happened in July of 1776. And third, why the founders perpetuated slavery. Regarding George Washington's elevation to commander in chief, there are in fact three reasons he was elected. One of them relates to the prevention of civil wars. First, as we all know, the Congress chose Washington for his courage on the battlefield. Owing to his service in the French and Indian War, Washington had a reputation as a fearsome military leader. He was known for saying things like this about his battlefield experience. The right wing where I stood <laughs> was exposed to and received all the enemy's fire. I heard bullets whistle and believe me, there is something charming in the sound. Washington was also, as we know as well, an awesome physical presence. He stood at six foot two with a straight backbone and he had a great aura of invincibility. The two other reasons Congress elected Washington have everything to do with his prominent leadership and military command of Virginia, which was then the flagship of the southern states. Washington was from Virginia and he was from the south and these two factors mattered enormously in the, in the Continental Congress's decision to appoint him Commander-in-Chief. The leaders of the Congress wanted, as John Adams called it, a Southern general. This is because they were desperate to unite the Southern colonies to the cause of war then taking place exclusively in New England. New Englanders wanted Southern help and a show of unity in order to defeat the British after Lexington and Concord. That's the second reason Washington was elected. It was to unite the northern and southern colonies behind the war. Third, many of the middle colony and southern colony delegates feared that a New England army led by a New England commander in chief posed a direct risk that New England would make war on the other American states. Here's one of our authorities on that, John Adams. The evidence of the fear I've just described is robust. As Adams made clear, the election of Washington was the product of a, quote, Southern party against a Northern and a jealousy against a New England army under the command of a New England general. In this, Adams was saying that the delegates in Congress feared the territorial expansionism, excuse, territorial imperialism of New England. And we have to remember that they lived in an age of imperialism. It was normal and expected that nations would expand and exploit their neighbors if they could. Here again in the selection of a, of a commander in chief, the founders feared a three-step chain reaction. First, the formation of a New England army commanded by a New England general. Second, that army would win the war of independence against England. And third, with its blood still pumping hard from victory, the New England army would impose its will by force of arms on the other states. Another delegate from New England, Ella Follett Dyer from Connecticut, 53 years old and also a former officer in the French and Indian War, affirmed in numerous letters that the dual purpose of Washington's appointment was to unite North and South and also to remove deep-seated fears in Southern leaders that the Continental Army might be turned against them. As Dyer wrote to the governor of Connecticut about Washington's ascension, quote, his appointment will tend to keep up the Union and more strongly cement the southern with the northern colonies, and it will serve to remove jealousies that an army composed principally of New Englanders will become formidable to the southern colonies. Remember that they did what they did to save their souls from civil wars. Fears of, fears of disunion and civil wars also explain why all 13 colonies signed on for a unanimous Declaration of Independence in July of 1776. Throughout all of June, in fact, many of the delegates from the middle colonies and South Carolina were flatly refusing to embark upon independence. 
Why were they so opposed? It was because they feared both defeat at the hands of the British and the consequences of uniting in one permanent government with other colonies that were so vastly different from them in geography, social and political order, economy, religion, labor systems, and for many, moral views of slavery. Let me tell you what happened on June 8th, 1776. The day before this, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia had formally proposed that the 13 states declare their collective independence from Britain. From Britain. The 8th was the first day of formal debates. According to Thomas Jefferson, delegates from the middle colonies and South Carolina drew a bright red line of disunion on the floor of Congress. Jefferson recorded, quote, that if such a declaration should now be agreed to, these delegates must retire and possibly their colonies secede from the Union. Edward Rutledge of South Carolina was one of those delegates. He feared both confederation and independence, specifically because he felt sure that New England intended to rule over the central government as a tyrant and possibly to exercise its domination by force of arms. In a letter to New York delegate John Jay, Rutledge argued that the New England leaders were from a lower socioeconomic strata of society, and therefore they would be dangerous to the first principle of constitutional government, the protection of private property. When Rutledge made explicit reference to the possibility that New England might exert its control over the other states by force, the South Carolinian, tough guy that he was, bragged that he himself did not fear the military and naval might of New England. Here is what he wrote to Jay. Quote, the force of their arms I hold exceedingly cheap, but I confess I dread their overruling influence in council. I dread their low cunning and those leveling principles which men without character and without fortune in general possess. And I hope that's not any of your ancestors, right? <laughs> Now let's talk about leveling principles. This is code word which we don't fully understand today. By leveling principles, a beautiful thing about New England, Rutledge meant principles of equality and democracy, but they might be imposed upon the other colonies without their consent. On another occasion, similarly, John Adams used the expression leveling spirit to describe the fears of many that one day the New England colonies might level the aristocratic societies of the middle colonies and the South. As Adams recorded in his diary, a New York delegate named Philip Livingston told him, quote, if England should turn us adrift, we should instantly go to civil wars among ourselves to determine which colony should govern all the rest. He seems to dread New England, the leveling spirit, etc. Hence were thrown out of Goths and Vandals. Can you imagine that? New Englanders being considered Goths and Vandals? I mean, I, I have incredible gratitude. I've, I've studied this period of history. I've got to tell you, New England is by far the greatest uh, region of our nation. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, so I'm not saying that with New England bias. Really, I don't think there would have been a revolution. We wouldn't be where we were without the spirit, not the leveling spirit, but the spirit of liberty of New England. Okay. Let's look now at the special dilemma that the middle colonies faced in 1776. The map tells the story because if New England and most of the southern colonies declared independence without the middle colonies, those in the middle would be caught in an impossible military situation. The middle colonies, as the name implies, are squeezed geographically between New England and the southern colonies, and that meant big trouble if they attempted to remain in the British Empire at the same time, the two regions flanking them declared independence, swearing that they would fight until the bitter end. If the middle colonies did not aid New England and the southern colonies in their war of independence, critically allowing free passage on roads and rivers, as well as supplying their armies, chances were that Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey, and New York would become the worst fields of blood in the expanding Civil War. I mean the Imperial Civil War there one that would now pit the middle colonies against New England and the southern colonies. When Congress first considered independence on June 7th and 8th, the question was simply too hot to handle. Soon after the secession threat that took place on the 8th, 
the delegates suspended deliberations altogether until July 1st, when they would reconvene and finally vote yes or no on independence. Monday, July 1st arrived, and what happened? The colonies voted, and the outcome was disastrous. Only nine colonies cast ballots for independence. Pennsylvania and South Carolina voted no. Delaware divided, rendering its vote null and void, and New York abstained because it lacked permission from its assembly either way. This was a day of extraordinary peril because by now, diehard Virginians and New Englanders, for sure, had no intention of backing down on independence. And as the vote demonstrated, a supermajority of Congress, nine colonies, were ready to move to independence immediately. So, the middle colonies in South Carolina were left with a life and death decision. Were they going to let the vote of July 1st stand and go their own way, perhaps asking to join the new United States at a later date? Or, much smarter, would they request a revote and quickly get into line with the pro-independent states? What would you have done if you were a middle colony delegate caught in this catch-22? Remain in the empire and fight against the New England and southern colonies? Or would you throw in your hat with the pro-independence people? I know what I would have done. And it's exactly what a sufficient number of anti-independence delegates chose to do under such extraordinary pressure. On July 1, they requested to revote the matter of independence the next day. And overnight, under an obvious injunction of join or die, the dissenting delegates from the Middle Colonies and South Carolina lined up the votes necessary for the passage of a unanimous resolution of independence. No moment better exemplifies the fact that the founding was a shotgun wedding more than this one. The Congress formally passed the resolution for independence on July 2nd, and two days later, it adopted the unanimous Declaration of Independence. Thomas McKean of Delaware later described that early July of 1776 was a do or die moment. Quote, unanimity in the 13 states, an all important point on so great an occasion was thus obtained. The dissension of a single state might have produced very dangerous consequences. Here again, with the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Independence, we see that the founders did what they did to save their souls from civil wars. Let's return now to the most profound and tragic uh, decision the founders made, the decision to perpetuate slavery despite the fact that they knew the practice was pure despotism. They did this not only during the American Revolution, but also afterwards in the United States Constitution that was ratified in 1788. The founders did nothing about slavery at these junctures for many reasons. By one historical interpretive lens, they committed this crime because they lived in a world of white supremacy that had been handed down to them by generations. By another interpretive lens, they perpetuated slavery because both Southerners and Northerners were inextricably tied up in an economic system that exploited the slave trade and slavery for profit. No matter how heinous these practices were, the economic interpretation explains, the founders simply could not break their addiction to the lucrative status quo. Both of these two explanatory models are correct. Yet, as the study of history often reveals, the story is more complex. The survivalist interpretation we have been examining today also explains why the founders perpetuated slavery. In every major decision they made in the 1770s and the 1780s, the founders felt the guns of disunion and civil war pointing them into the Union, and that includes the decisions they made about the slave trade and slavery. If any northern state at that time had demanded that the collective United States abolish the slave trade or adopt even a gradual plan for emancipation, one or more southern states would have seceded from the Union. Others would follow. Next, they would form a southern confederacy. And after that, civil wars over finances, commerce, and land would ensue. In perpetuating, the slavery, in perpetuating slavery, the founders made what I like to call a devil's bargain, meaning that they knew they could either advance a federal program for liberating black Americans from slavery or they could secure freedom from civil wars for themselves. They chose the latter, self-preservation, 
with vast and tragic consequences for the future of the nation they began. All three of these interpretations, the white supremacist interpretation, the economic interpretation, and the survivalist interpretation are correct. Added together, they get us far closer to understanding why the founders perpetuated slavery than we have ever been before. Let's begin to wind down by returning to the brain and the extraordinary influence of fear on the lives of individuals and on the lives of nations. So powerful is fear that it drove forward the improbable formation of one United States rather than two or three separate nations. So powerful is fear, tragically, that it overwhelmed the consciences, the compassion, the caring, and the moral sensibility of the founders to the point that they perpetuated slavery decade after decade after decade. It would take until the 1850s for a new generation of courageous American political leaders to finally say no more. The expansion of slavery must end now. As we know, this principled stand against slavery in the mid-19th century led to disunion and civil war on a massive scale. Finally, I want to celebrate complex history and complex truth. Not simplistic history, not one-dimensional truth, but multi-dimensional understanding of complex phenomena, just like why the founders perpetuated slavery. Complex history is so important in a democracy because it's the most powerful medicine I know for maturing us as individuals and for maturing us as a society. What happens when a person only accepts a single simplistic interpretation of the causation of something as complex as why the founders formed one nation or why they perpetuated slavery? It narrows your mind. It makes you righteous and divisive, and it makes you a force for polarization, tribalism, culture wars, and history wars. On the other hand, if we challenge our brains to accept the white supremacist interpretation, and also the economic interpretation and the survivalist interpretation. That is, if we take a and both approach rather than an either or approach, we grow emotionally and intellectually, and in doing so, we help our democracy survive and thrive. This dynamic salutary effect of complex truth on our minds and on our democracy is one reason I love history so much. It's also why I believe that we as a nation should teach history in grades K through college with the same priority, intensity, and vigor as reading, writing, and arithmetic. Thank you. Here's my info. I, I love feedback from people. I, I grow and, and develop. I've written some op-eds that have earned me a lot of hate mail, but I also get a lot of uh, fan mail, too. But so if you have any comments for me, recommendations, reach out. See. Thank you so much, um, Professor Merritt, Eli. Um, we are going to sit down and uh, spend a little bit of time uh, in dialogue with all of you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to open the floor to questions and comments in just a moment. Um, but while you are all formulating your thoughts, I thought I'd just begin by asking you a couple of questions just to kick things off. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating way of thinking about the founding era. Um, and I just I want to start uh, in that era, um, in, in the 1770s and the 1780s, and, and, um, and ask this question. So you've, you've painted a picture for us of a world in which um, folks are surrounded by the fear that there are folks over in those other colonies who are, you know, they're surely out to gain supremacy over the interests of my colony or, or my region. Um, and I, I wonder, um, because what you haven't done is paint us a picture of folks who actually were conspiring in that way. Um, were these fears founded um, or were they purely imagined? And does it matter? <laughs> um, this is on, yes. You know, I think that's a very important point, uh, even if they were simply imagined, which in some ways the first 86 years of our history disproves. It, 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 
I mean, empirical evidence was generated that they were not imagining this because of the north-south conflicts that we did have over slavery, essentially beginning as soon as uh, the American Revolution concluded. Um, but no, there were real troublemakers. I didn't bring up today a, a man named Thomas Burke from North Carolina, who when he first arrived at the Continental Congress, he wrote a letter that is so revealing. And I do want to point out that at that time, talking about disunion and civil wars was considered to be very taboo. It might be a stretch to call it treason, but they were very frightened, of course, of the American Revolution, and they needed to do everything, particularly publicly, that they could as the leaders to suggest that we are a unified band of brothers. But Thomas Burke came up very clearly on a reconnaissance mission to really figure out, was this union going to work out? So I don't have it in front of me right now, but he wrote back several letters to North Carolina laying out, similar to some of the other examples I've given, what could happen here, outlining whether or not New England was going to be dangerous to North Carolina. He had a whole other system of worries. He worried that the three largest uh, colonies, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Massachusetts, would somehow band together, and they would exercise a, a form of hegemony over the rest of the colonies. So they were very worried about this, and I think it's important to recognize, I, sp I spoke of it, but we don't really understand now, you know, post, until Ukraine, post-World War II, thankfully, there's sort of an end to at least European imperialism. But again, I want to suggest they lived in an age of imperialism where, very different from our mentalities, if you had a lot of power, if you had a navy, and those folks had you know, tobacco that you could make a lot of money on, it might be considered a bit normal to over, overrun them and take control. So uh, there, what, what's fascinating to think of also is a sense of, to borrow from psychology, particularly Carl Jung, this idea of a collective unconscious, heard of that? I think there was a collective unconscious for those who were willing to allow these fears to penetrate through into their consciousness, like James Madison, who was very awake to the dangers of the American Union. Other people, as we know, you can think of people, some people just repress fears, other people experience them. And I think if you can experience them, process them rationally, and lead, those are the best leaders. I think, I think Lincoln had that skill as well. Thanks, Eli. Um, one more question, and then I'll open it up to our audience. Um, so we today live in an era um, where there is, again, fear of the motives of our uh, fellow country people and um, some fear of disunion, whether uh, misplaced or not. Uh, as you were writing this book and also living in our fractious present, uh, what lessons did you see here that might illuminate uh, what we experience in our political life today? That's a, that's a great question, and I do think there are some things. I think the first thing to recognize is well, there's a continuity to politics and political problems. I do think that preceding the Civil War, all the, all the way back to 1774, the First Continental Congress, through the beginning of the Civil War, so that 86-year period, they legitimately feared, <laughs> it's been my thesis today, disunion and civil war. So when your fellow politician from South Carolina indicated that, you know, there, you better do what we're requesting or we might have to secede from the Union. And maybe there was times when it was brinksmanship, but they took it very seriously. Now maybe we're entering into a period where we might be taking that seriously, but still, there's no, we do not perceive today a very legitimate manner of separation and formation of separate countries. For one reason, that the civil, our American Civil War, which had many accomplishments and motives, one of the most significant, Lincoln's original um, intent was to demonstrate that the Union was perpetual. You might be interested to know that the Articles of Confederation, all of the iterations of that, including the one they signed and ratified in 1781, repeated three times, this Union shall be perpetual. Very interesting. U.S. Constitution doesn't say that, which in some ways created some of the controversy leading to the Civil War. But why didn't it say that? My theory is, I, I can't find any good writing about this, but my theory is, I think is correct, is, you know, we just adopted a constitution in 1781. We said it was perpetual, and now we're throwing it out. 
It would just be a double hypocrisy to say this one is now perpetual. <laughs> but I want to more specifically answer, I didn't speak today. I, I've created a picture that the only reason our union was formed was due to these fears of civil war and, 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 and disunion and civil war. But there's another fundamental reason they were able to stay united, and that is because they were practitioners of civic virtue. I really mean that. I, I, I could give a whole nother talk and maybe I'll do some writing about that. But they practice civic virtue. So I think if they didn't have that, if they were a band of demagogues, no matter how hard they tried to overcome the centrifugal forces of disunion, they would have failed. So they succeeded because they had to in the manner that we've discussed today, but they also succeeded because of civic virtue, meaning they interacted with one another in a political manner, in a way demonstrating civility, respect, cooperation, and compromise. So they compromised again because they had to, but they also compromised because they knew that was part of what they had to do. So the opposite, one opposite, I'll, I'll say, one opposite of civic virtue is demagoguery and demagogues. And we all know that since 2016 and maybe a little bit before, we have been suffering in our politics from the elevation of demagogues which is, if you study the history of democracy hard, what you find is demagogues are very dangerous to democracies. Demagogues can bring down democracies. And then that to boot, we have news media, which I do believe in the fourth branch of government, the fourth estate. We have the news media that's demagogic. So uh, if we could find a way to deal with our demagoguery in politics and news, we have a very bright future. There is no question. So the great danger, I think, is demagoguery. And I'll just end by saying, they took it pretty seriously. When there was a rumor that one of the delegates they had selected to go to the Continental Congress was up there making trouble and expressing a disunion, disunionist sentiments, word would get back to the assembly and they would fire the person. Many letters from George Washington said, you must get your best men into the Continental Congress now. And by that, he meant statesmen, people who would put the pursuit of liberty as embodied in the American Revolution, as embodied in the union they were all forming together. So we can talk another time about how do we get, how do we get to this? I have some ideas. One is to actually discontinue our manner of presidential nominations. The primaries are adding all sorts of pain all sorts of demagoguery, all sorts Don't of... Don't tell New Hampshire. Don't. <laughs> this pluralistic, this not pluralistic, but plurality manner, Donald Trump or someone becomes the Republican nominee based on 30% of the electorate. Anyway, I believe that the parties should come up with the nominees and then the people should pick the president. That's a whole other topic. So interesting. All right, I'm going to open things up now for questions from the audience. Because uh, we are recording this, I'm going to ask if you do have a question, raise your hand, and uh, our fabulous director of events, Jakia Brittle, will bring you a microphone, and, uh, and you can ask your question um, with the microphone. Thank you. So we've got one here. Hi, good evening. Uh, first off, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, it's um, Growing up in the Philippines, uh, which was a U.S. colony, and which very very few people <laughs> uh, realize, um, I used to read U.S. history books. It wasn't a required subject back then, mm. but I just read it just f for the you know for the sheer curiosity of it, and the information that you shared with us this evening is something that I never read before. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my question for tonight is that um, during the generation of our founding fathers, there were very few republics. But why did they choose to become a republic? Why did the founders choose to become a republic? Um, they chose to become a republic because they were great students of history, great students of the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire, particularly the Roman Empire and the Ro Roman Republic, more importantly, and the Greek democracy. And they simply felt that it was a natural evolution of the form of government they had been living in for the past 100 years, 
And that is to say, if you start with the English Civil War in the 1650s, that, the beheading of Charles I, that was a movement towards empowering parliament, meaning the people. So, and then the Glorious Revolution of 1688 was a much more radical movement in that direction where the parliament actually finally gained uh, primacy over monarchy. So in some ways they were just progressing to the next step, ultimately, that monarchy was not necessary. They were living in a monarchy by that time. I think it's actually correct, even though the parliament was very problematic to the 13 colonies. It can be described as a monarchical republic. I think that's very, very some very thoughtful writers at the time, Cato, who wrote Cato's letters, have said that. So I just thought they, they, they really wanted to get rid of arbitrary government and government where uh, one man or woman, and then one man had extreme, had, had extreme power over the entire government. So that they felt it was the, the best form of government you could possibly uh, evolve, so they went for it in that direction. Sure. Is the separation of powers an original American idea? Separation of powers? Uh, no, I, you know, if you really look at it, the separation of powers informally has certainly been present since the, the Roman Republic. But most critically, the, uh, the Spirit of the Laws by Montesquieu, published within 50 years or so before the American Revolution, if I'm thinking correctly, it clearly embodied the principle of, the, of separation of powers more than any other book. I'm not sure if John Locke touched on that or not, but it was pretty well established that you needed, we needed checks and balances and to suddenly rush forward to where we are today. That's why I believe that we need to reform our presidential nominating system because all aspects of government and politics need checks and balances. And so what we did, some of you are of adequate age where you might remember uh, the reforms of the 1970s. That's when we opened up primaries and removed the political parties as a check and balance, check and balance on who would evolve uh, into the presidential pipeline. So we need to restore power to the political parties, however we do it. We could have primaries, but ultimately they should have the power to veto the elevation of any candidate in a, the Democratic National Convention or Republican National Convention who clearly demonstrates him or herself not to put their oath of office above all things, not to put the Constitution above self and party. So we're in some trouble there with our presidential nominating system, and I really hope we will wise up and, 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 and reform it. So that's a form of checks and balances more than separation of powers, but it's intimately connected to what you're asking. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, it was really super interesting. And um, I love the way that you've shown us how fear was an incredible motivation and fear of disunion was an incredible motivation for um, the, for the politicians of the, of, the, of the revolutionary period. But I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about um, the deployment of fear or the fomenting of fear as a way of motivating the population. Um, particularly since, as you talked about demagoguery, that's what demagogues do, right? Is that they create um, some sort of thing or person or group of people to be feared as a way to get you to, as a way of persuading you to their side. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about any, um, uh, about the, the role of the fomenting of fear during the period. My, my thought when you say that is that, of course, we know there are real fears and then there are manufactured fears. So George Washington standing up with all the civic virtue that he embodied and saying, Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great, great danger approaching us. And that is that in the passage of the coercive acts after the Boston Tea Party, the British Parliament has demonstrated that our liberties are unsafe. So I want you to arm with me to defend our liberties and freedoms. Well, that's not demagoguery, but that certainly is telling people there's danger and I need you to step forward and give up your life 
for our country, for liberty and, const and constitutionalism. The difference is, again, as we've so beautifully uh, experienced evidence in the past seven and three quarters years, not being specific in any manner, is demagogues raise up a tidal wave of fear for the self, for the self, to gain the limelight or to gain power. So that's, I think, the dramatic difference there, that if one way to think about it is this, is this speaker speaking to me of fear and perhaps trying to motivate me and trigger fear within me for my own benefit and for the benefit of future generations, or is this individual standing up and doing this with demagoguery for self benefit. And as, as we know, proof in the pudding in the past seven and three quarters year as well, eight years as well, your question is fantastic and I really appreciate you asking that because there are plenty of people who have not been able to really understand the motivations of Donald Trump and that they are, I really say, by no fault of his own because as we know I'm a psychiatrist and he's got a developmental history that made him the way he is. By no fault of his own, this is how he goes about trying to gain a sense of emotional satisfaction and grandeur and grandiosity. So, but we as the people, and even a bit more, the leadership of the Republican Party needs to constantly be reminding us. I, I think Trump as a demagogue, I've written a piece in the LA Times, I called him the Supreme American Demagogue. It's very dangerous, it's been frightening for many. Um, but I think it's the most wonderful learning opportunity we have to truly understand how democracy works. And so in that spirit with the former Chancellor Vanderbilt, I'm happy to be teaching a course in the spring called How Democracies Thrive. And demagogues will form an important part of that. And bringing civic virtue, we have to come up with a new term. I know civic virtue is not a sexy term. I call it ethical leadership. Uh, we have to bring that back. And, all, and I hate to say this, all our problems will be solved if we do that. I hate to be simplistic because I believe in complex history, but I do believe civic virtue is a glue that can really uh, bring us back and lead us into perhaps another 250 uh, years of positive history. So optimistic. Uh, <laughs> we have a question here in the front row. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk and congratulations on the book. Uh, can you go back to the Continental Congress and why, um, I mean, like, if there was a Winston Churchill, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, I think that's, that's, that's what he said. Did anyone bring it out into the discussion that you, you have you know, fears of the New, New England invasion or the domination by, you know, a confederation of Virginia and New England? Did they, if there were such good statesmen there, were the the people who were subconsciously afraid of disunion, were they in the majority? I mean, why couldn't they negotiate and say, tell us what you're worried about, and we'll promise not to do it, and we'll, we'll pledge our, you know, our, our good, sacred honor not to, we will treat you all as, as equals if, if we yeah. confederate and go forward for independence. Yeah, I, I follow that, and I think What's critical to understand as we're contemplating that question is we, in hindsight, say there's one United States. Why didn't they stand up and just say, hey guys, we need to rally around this one United States? And the real reason is, is I don't know the statistics, but there, there was no certain sense that people had of forming a United States. They all agreed, I didn't see anyone not agree that during the War of Independence, they, can, they should ally together for defense and for the protection of liberty. But to complicate matters even more, you had 13 colonies that, most of which in 1776, some of which before the Declaration of Independence, declared their own independence. And they felt, we gotta remember how different and isolated all of these colonies were from one another. They felt at that moment they were forming 13 separate republics. We, there really were 13 separate republics. So what happens, you're gonna bring 13 separate republics together into three confederations, or are we gonna bring them together into one confederation, and how will it last? John Witherspoon, I think impartial answer to what you're saying, 
John Witherspoon, some of them just knew. And that's why this whole progression from incredibly weak form of government to the Articles of Confederation, which was stronger than what they had, onward to 1787 to a strong government, he knew we have to have a strong government to hold us together or otherwise, as he said, we'll, we'll fall into disunion and civil wars. So they needed really excellent leadership. And when I said earlier that he stood up and vehemently asked this, begged them, don't make this terrible mistake of just thinking we can, we can ally loosely, uh, that there was a sense of knowing. And a lot of them, to the points here earlier as well, were just absolutely avid students of history. And I've come to believe, and this is a bit of a peril for us today, I've come to believe that we human beings are not smart enough alone to deal with complications like we are encountering in our democracy today. We need history. I don't think we're smart enough without history. We need to be reading history. And the founders that rose to the top, John Adams and Madison, Jefferson and Washington, they were avid readers and studiers of role models from the past. So that's another if we could press that button and get rid of demagogues and get in ethical leadership and then have everyone educated in history, as I said, it, as much as reading and, and, and writing and arithmetic, that would be another saving grace, I believe. Such idealism. <laughs> we need um, it. We need it. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, there have, I saw a few other hands uh, up earlier. Are there any other questions? Um, we've got one in the back corner over here. Doing the problem of conciliating all the people and getting them together, I was taught that um, Ben Franklin was the most influential mediator, but I'm not sure, and I'd like to get that clear in my mind. Which persons were really able to convince New York and these other delegates who, who uh, didn't want to vote for the initial union? Thank you. Good question. So, in 1775, you know, Ben Franklin was essentially kicked out of London, and he, and he got on a boat, and he came back to Philadelphia. I think he'd been absent for 15 years. And they immediately appointed him as a delegate to the Continental Congress. I think he had a couple of weeks. And so he goes, I don't know where it is, he goes up to his studio, and he gets to work writing a constitution. So here is another, you're right, a conciliator, but also just intelligent, <laughs> or I'll say constitutionally intelligent. You may know that he tried to bring about the first constitution at the Albany, Con Albany Congress, in Congress in 1754. But so Franklin draws up this constitution, I'm sure, for every reason that we've discussed today. And he, so he comes to now the Second Con Continental Congress uh, after Lexington and Concord. And he's a smart guy, and he meets Thomas Jefferson, and he shows it to Thomas Jefferson and says, we're going to really need a constitution here, we're going to get in big trouble. And Jefferson says, I agree. But he said, do not propose a constitution now. Don't do it. I'll tell you why. It's too much of a Pandora's box. We need to unite behind this war only. If you start talking about how we're going to represent the people, then we talk about slavery, you're going to blow this thing up. You're going to blow us up by trying to introduce a constitution. You are going to cause so much fighting that we won't even be able to unite behind the war. That is so interesting to me. So Franklin, you know, he's an independent thinker. He's not going to just follow the directive of some upstart like Thomas Jefferson. He actually, towards the end of the Second Continental Congress, stands up and he says, Something, I paraphrase. I would like to propose to you, the rest of my fellow Americans, as we embark upon this war, an idea. I, I'm not asking you to vote on a constitution yet, but I just want you to know, and he, he, he submits it for their review, and he says, don't vote on it. I just want you to know, if things get any worse in this war with Britain, 
I think we're going to really need a constitution like this to sort of survive by and to, and to win the war. So I didn't mention Ben Franklin today. You're right. There's so many people who have not gotten due recognition here today, and James Madison is certainly one of them, uh, and Sam Adams. Sam Adams is very prominent in the book, and he thought Sam Adams was ready to launch a New England Confederation be, to, to declare independence because the other colonies were moving along too sluggishly, um, and that was not an act of treason. He just wanted to save his own people. So, Franklin, I could also tell you, in the book also, I describe the Treaty of Paris, uh, which was finalized, of course, in 1783, and the way that John Jay of New York, John Adams of Massachusetts, and Benjamin Franklin handled a very challenging negotiation in which they had to pursue northern interest and southern interest because if they went home and they only got, for example, New England's access to the Newfoundland fisheries, they didn't get the southerners' western lands to the Mississippi or the navigation of the Mississippi River. The worry was this, they present this Treaty of Paris, half the country would say this is totally unfair. It's obviously biased towards New England or the South. So Franklin is an absolutely magical character. I agree with you. Thank you for a terrific talk again. Uh, so the, the, the delegates to the Continental Congress obviously could have easily looked to Europe as you alluded to see the consequence of uh, neighboring powers making war with each other for economic expedience. Uh, certainly they would have had examples closer to home. Obviously the Native American tribes would likewise make war on their neighbors for economic expedience. The Wampanoag people here made an alliance with the colonists to prevent, they thought, attacks from the Narragansett and so forth. But I wonder, um, there was also, of course, the positive example of the Iroquois Confederacy in terms of the ability of a confederation under a democratic government to, in very practical terms, prevent war. These five nations, of course, had been making war with each other, and, and that was, of course, uh, an amazing and, I, I dare say, successful experiment that predated our Constitution. Did that understanding figure into the thinking that you described in some of these quotes of these delegates? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. And then it's a continuation of the discussion of Benjamin Franklin. My, my strongest area of knowledge in the period is not Native American history or indigenous people history, but <laughs> I will tell you that Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter, I think it was within several years of the abysmal failure of the Albany Congress in 1754. And of course, then they were not uniting to protect themselves from Britain, they were uniting to protect themselves from the French and the French's, the French's Indian allies. Franklin, so to start with the, the Albany Congress, none of the southern colonies even come at all, right? So it's already a failure before it even gets going. Then there's sort of the rumor that a lot of people who came, <laughs> they weren't really there to form a, you know, a, a constitutional form of government with the others. They came there and they started doing all sorts of commerce with one another and there were Native American groups that were there, they were making land deals. Um, so afterwards, Franklin was so dispirited that in one of his letters, he said something equivalent to this. This is unbelievable to me, that we cannot form any sort of confederation among ourselves. And he specifically said, when the, uh, the six, I think it was six or five minutes of Iroquois have done this so successfully. So I certainly think he was inspired by that, but he also, I think, it caused some pessimism within him. And he went on in another letter to say that he thought the colonies would really never be able to unite for any reason. So as you, 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 Americans are considered to be fractious, rambunctious people, very self-seeking, I think this idea of who comes here and like I'm here and seeking my own, I'm gonna move to the next frontier and get land, I think there was something inherently uncooperative uh, about Americans, perhaps as compared to other nations. Of course, they weren't a nation. But I'm glad you brought that up. Brings us back to Benjamin Franklin and his absolute shock that Native people were so much more successful at forming representative government and uniting than, than the colonies were. Such fantastic questions this evening. Um, I think we have time for one more, if there is anybody who has not yet had a chance. 
I loved your talk. It was uh, very interesting about the, the fear aspect of forming our country. Um, but I've always maintained, in my head anyway, that, uh, and you could probably you know, give a thought to this, at what point in history uh, have so many great people been able to get together mm -hmm. to do what they did? Mm -hmm. The minds that they had, and at any point in history in the past, could have anything like that have taken place? I, that's a great question, and I think we're at a juncture in our historiography or the way we're looking back at the past where, for better and for worse, we're not idolizing the founders in the way we've done in the past. So that would, in some ways, open us up to actually begin to explore, wait a minute, how did, there were, you know, two million people then, 1.5 million white people who would therefore perhaps in some ways be more eligible uh, for leadership. Um, so the question is, how did they rise to the top? Or were all the political leaders in the 13 colonies of this type of caliber? The answer to that is definitely not. And that would, I think that brings us back to the question of civic virtue, that for the most part, they, these 13 assemblies when they were gathering together, all the delegates were selected by the assemblies. They were selecting the folks who would go up to the Congress. And again, I think they had the notion that this is difficult stuff, so we have to send our best people. And when they said their best people, they were finding a balance between, there's no doubt, they wanted to send delegates who would stand for the interest of their constituents. That was as true then as now. But they had this greater knowledge, I think, and a larger culture of civic virtue or a civic ethos. So I think if we looked at that question, it wasn't just that the founders of the United States ended up being great individuals, great leaders, great statesmen. I think they were pushed upward by, uh, by, their, by, by their colonial governments because, in fact, they were the select let's call it 100 or 150, we think of it as smaller, who actually, they believed, could hold this fragile thing and potentially disastrous, catastrophic thing called the United States together. But you're, you're talking about the study of leadership, and that's another thing we need to do along with civic virtue and banishing demagogues and demagoguery. Wonderful. Well, the Romans, of course, did banish them. You know about ostracism, right? That was designed around getting rid of... Uh, of, um, of demagogues. So I jest when I say banishment, but I don't. <laughs> well, on that note, um, I want to ask you all to join me, please, in thanking uh, Professor Merritt for sharing his research with us this evening and treating us to such an illuminating discussion. Um, and thanks also to all of you for joining us tonight, whether here at Old South Meeting House or online with the Forum Network and asking such fantastic questions. Uh, I do hope that you will return uh, frequently to our spaces for future programs and events throughout this anniversary year and beyond. Um, up next for us at Revolutionary Spaces on June 29th is Benjamin Franklin, Rattlesnakes and Pepe the Frog, Memes in American Politics, that's with Joan Donovan, a leading public scholar and disinformation researcher. Mm. That's going to take place here at Old South Meeting House. Um, and uh, just up the street at the Old State House, don't miss our newest exhibit, Impassioned Destruction, Politics, Vandalism, and the Tea Party. That explores the role of violence in American protest from the Tea Party to January 6th. Um, that will open uh, again at the Old State House on July 1st. Uh, so for those who are here on site, uh, please stay uh, after we uh, end here for informal conversation and refreshment. Um, there are going to be copies of, prof of Professor Merritt's book for sale over in the corner at the table over there, and the author will be available to sign copies uh, until um, 8 p.m. for anybody who is interested. So thanks again, and I hope everybody has a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you.